Hello, and welcome to another episode of Spoiled Games. I'm Adam Sessler, executive producer of Rev3 Games. Uh, this is the show where myself and colleagues sit around and talk about games. Sometimes we like them, sometimes we don't, but very interesting things come in the process. Uh, it's called Spoiled Games for a reason. Today we are talking about Dead Space 3. If you have not finished the game and you would like to have surprises happen at the end, you might want to stop, finish the game, and come back to this video. For everyone else, we're going to talk about everything, nothing, is off limits. I'm happy to have Tara Long of Rev3 Games, who did the review for us, and our special guest, Arthur Geese of Polygon. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me. So, uh, the Dead Space series, I think all three of us have played the other games and enjoyed the other games. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think, Tara, is kind of like the kernel of, 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 of what makes Dead Space game a Dead Space game? A lot of people think it's survival horror, others yeah, don't. I've, I feel like survival horror is kind of a wide net to cast, but uh, there are some things that I think make it survival horror and some that don't. Obviously, immersion is a huge thing in the whole franchise. Um, I never once felt like I wasn't powerful, though, which I think is something that really has to be there in order to qualify as survival horror. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, ammo has never been a scarce thing. Sure, there's, like, it's got sort of the level design of survival horror games and a lot of winding corridors, but for the most part, I think it relies on cheap scares more than, you know, <laughs> actual, like, suspense. Those were very expensive scares, <laughs> yes. I assure you. I mean, how, like, how do you sort of, like, characterize what the Dead Space series is? Uh, I think it's always been about the, the, the expensive cheap scares. Uh, and also, uh, creative combat and puzzle solving is sort of where it's always... Uh, like, that's been the core of the series for me, even going from Dead Space to Dead Space 2, which shifted tonally quite a bit, uh, there was still an emphasis on creative use of tools as a way to overcome obstacles. And there was way more of a focus on that than, than event really any other game has, um, particularly with like uh, dismemberment as a combat mechanic and using enemies' own body parts against them with stuff like Kinesis. And, and, and especially in the first one, that whole idea of the dis dismemberment, you're using things that aren't supposed to be weapons. I mean, I, I love the way that the, the world felt organic. You are this guy who's an engineer, and you have engineering tools that happen to also be deadly and project things mm -hmm. like a gun. And I mean, I, I, I always thought it was really nice how they kind of, you know, tie all the logic together. It's not just, you know, hapless guy finds gun, kills things. Yeah. Right. I like that there's an escalating sense of resourcefulness through the series, too. Like in the first one, Isaac is using his tools. In the second one, Isaac it starts the game by building tools and is looking for a way off. And then in the third one, the weapon crafting obviously takes that way further yeah. than it ever did. It ever went. And same goes for the story also, which develops a lot more over the course of the series than in the first one, which is pretty much non-existent. Yeah, I mean, like in the first two, I mean, he, he's very alone. You know, yeah. it, it, it's just, you know he, he's lonely man in scary place. It was kind of interesting to see the shift into Dead Space Three, where you know there's other characters there. He comes across as a little bit human. He has a love interest. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a jerk. Yeah, for a lot well, of the game, <laughs> everyone seems to be kind of a jerk. <laughs> in this game. Which I guess is understandable because there are lots of really awful things happening everywhere. But uh, I think the thing about the first Dead Space game, from a story-wise perspective, is that there wasn't a lot of story. There was fiction. There was a lot of stuff going on with the unitologist slash Scientology thing, and the the girlfriend angle was obviously something that it alluded to continuously, but it didn't it didn't use that as the primary driving force of the game. It was like set piece moments and like concepts, and then the second one pushed that a little further, but it was still rooted a lot in the idea of ambiance and environmental storytelling over this really strong narrative, and the third one tries for more. So at least there's that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did you find it jarring? I mean, it was kind of surprising when the game begins. A, you're on Earth. It's really not really recognizable as Earth, but they're, I'm, I'm, I'm told it's Earth, and so yeah. I'm, I'm going to take the word on that. But that suddenly there's a sense of greater context, and I couldn't tell with, with both that and the other characters that are throughout the game if that somehow kind of undermines the, the, the horror because you're, you're, you're not alone. I... I personally don't, because again, I don't think the horror is built on a sense of like psychological suspense. I think it's more just, oh, something's popping out at you. Oh, something's like, you know, you're being rushed by 20 guys or something. And I feel the game takes sort of a natural progression. You know, you get most of the story in Dead Space 2 comes near the end of the game. 
And so it makes sense that by the time you reach the third game, the story would be a little bit more developed. And I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that it's right. like that, it's just different. I think in, I, I agree in that it's a departure in a lot of ways, just the way that it starts and the way that it sort of ramps up to the, the sort of expected dead spacey moments. But it doesn't blink while it's doing it. I mean, it starts with that, that prologue sequence, which is cool but doesn't make a lot of sense where it takes place like 200 years before mm -hmm. and you're on the colony uh, in the archaeological dig and that's its sort of way of introducing uh, the tutorial stuff in a way that I think is good because at this point I if I had to go through another tutorial as Isaac, I re would really not understand because <laughs> he has killed so many of these things that it, it's like the sort of cognitive dissonance. But when it when it gets to Isaac in his apartment and Carver comes in, it it just handles it without flinching in such a way that I just went with it. Like I didn't have time to stop and think, well, this is what Dead Space is. It was just, well, this is what this game is, and mm -hmm. here we go. So I, I, I want to talk about the character of Danik, um, which. I, I have to say, the, the way he's represented in the game was not what I had anticipated. Um, this kind of smooth-talking English accent and kind of a neo-hipster. Clark, and here we are. The marker homeworld. He's kind of the religious zealot that's going to bring about the end of the universe. I, I, I thought it was a very interesting choice, and I, I actually almost wanted to see him show up more in the cutscenes. I don't know if I want to deal with that much more of him and his followers throughout yeah. the game. I, and, I mean, you find, like, text logs throughout the game of communications that he's giving to his flock about what's happening, and, and the thing that's kind of interesting about Dead Space 3 from a setting point of view is how really awful everything has gone across, like, colonized space between the end of Dead Space 2 and the beginning of Dead Space 3 to the point where there's been a religious revolution. Um, so hearing him talk to his flock about how it's a good thing that everyone is going to die, that they're going to, that that they know now like what uh, convergence is, and that they're trying to spin it now as a new part of their sort of like theology is really interesting. Danik, okay, he, he seems like the central bad guy, and then at the very end of the game, it's like you kind of see him off in a corner, and like a big stalactite just kind of comes and impales him, and it was like I, I, I was a little yeah. bit, I, I, I kind of thought there was going to be. Something a little something more greater. Something more noble for this yeah, character. Yeah, I feel I do feel like his character was sort of just there to act as a centralized villain and near the end of the game they were like, crap, this game is actually about Isaac, you know, and his whole situation. And so they just sort of killed him off so they could really focus on Isaac's story. It's at a the sort end. of ignominious like Indiana Jones movie villain death. Yeah. Where it's <laughs> like, well no, it, it wasn't Isaac that did it, it was fate. Yeah. <laughs> He was such an asshole that he had to die by stalactite. Well, it's also guy with glasses and British accent, massive monster that's warping around and slapping people and is actually much scarier. Yep. Now, it, going to the combat, and what was really the, sort of the, the core of the game, so many people wanted to regard this game as somehow a, a, a Gears of Warification of Dead Space, and I did not see it that way. I mean, I, it really seemed to be the same kind of very solid, and I find it very satisfying combat yeah. that, that you've had in the other Dead Space games. I feel like the people who said that are people who haven't played the full game and don't know the extent to which that's true. Because there are shooting segments that do feel very yearsy, but they're such a small overall part of the game. I feel like it's almost negligible. I mean, first, the cover system in that game is terrible. Yeah. So every and it's, and it's not very useful either. I mean, you don't need it. It's yeah. an awful mistake. Uh, but also, I, I think that the last two Dead Space games gave a little bit more of opportunity to make it the survival horror game that some people wanted it to be, and there's less of, the, of there's less room for that in mm -hmm. Dead Space Three because they are definitely throwing more things at you. They definitely want you to use heavier firepower. They definitely keep throwing things at you, saying, "Hey, here's this new thing. Try it." And the other Dead Space games, you could go through those games using only the plasma cutter, and mm -hmm. most people did. Most people didn't use anything except for the plasma cutter or maybe the javelin gun because there was that one part with the chargers where it said, well, you should probably use the javelin gun. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, good, it's good to take the game's advice when it says that. <laughs> yeah, and so there's, like, if you, you only have one weapon, you're only using one type of ammo, and you're sort of actively being discouraged from using the guns because the plasma rifle in the first Dead Space was terrible. Uh, then I think that that fosters this sense that I have to be careful with this one weapon. And in Dead Space 3, you, it's not. It's combat all the time. And for me, the, like, I was thinking of Banjo Nuts and Bolts way more than I was thinking of Gears of War because I was always looking for that new thing that I could use to rearrange my stuff. 
Baby Jim nuts and bolts. I, 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 I see your logic now. <laughs> That's not the game that I ever invoked. You were saying, Tara? Um, I just, you know, I think. I feel like the third one took a lot more risks than the previous two, and that's why I'm willing to sort of forgive things like the cover system, because it's not a huge part of the game. And it's also like they were trying something, you know? It may not have worked necessarily, but sure. I think it makes up for it in other places like the weapon crafting. But also, I mean, there, there is something very satisfying about the combat. And, and, and you're talking about how, like, you know, a lot of people just use the plasma cutter. I'm, I'm one of those guys. There's something about that gun I just really, really enjoy it. I've never been able to put, put my finger on it. It's just, it's one of the most deeply satisfying weapons I've played in a, in, in a video game. It cuts things off. It does. I guess, yeah, I, I, I guess it's maybe the, if, if not puzzly way that you're just kind of, it, it's, it's so meticulous and it's so deliberate that you really feel like you're, you're accomplishing something. You're not just blindly firing. I barely everywhere. used it during the third game, actually. As soon as I could make another weapon that actually performed decently <laughs> well, I was like, so long. I mean, it was, it, was, it was a fairly dynamic system. I mean, I, it, it, once, once you get the sense of, OK, I see how this works, and I see what the logic is, I mean, there are some odd weapons you could make. Them sure, back and I mean, the thing that's interesting to me is listening to people talk about this game in a while. I hear a lot of people say, well, you only have to use this weapon to play the game. But every time I hear that, they're talking about a different weapon. Like everybody finds this one or two weapon combination yeah. that fits their playstyle, and they stick with it. And I didn't necessarily do that. I was experimenting through the end, except for I'm very solidly on Team Force Gun. Like I used the Force Gun the entire game and just added different things to the top and bottom of it. And but the Force Gun is the one that you sort of charge up. No, it just you fire it and it knocks things yeah. over. That's right. And that was a very convenient thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but with the, like, I would use the plasma cutter and throw like a ripsaw underneath it, or throw a blowtorch. I was constantly, well, what is this new thing that this weapon can do? And I really liked experimenting with that. And and so it's it's interesting to me that so many people still gravitate towards specific configurations. Yeah, especially since they didn't really, they didn't really. Uh, there's nothing holding you back from experimenting with weapons because yeah. you could dismantle them just as quickly as you could build them. And there are so many benches. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're always there. And it's kind of like, okay, let's let's see what I have. What can I tweak? What can I play with? I mean, it, it, it's this nice kind of respite throughout the game to just kind of sit down and say, okay. And, and I, I think it did also allow them to open up some of the combat scenarios more, that yeah. they could throw more enemies at you. I don't think they did a very good job telegraphing you that, hey, you might want something that's better crowd control yeah. <laughs> for, for the next hour. But I, I, I definitely saw collections of enemies I had not seen in, in, in the previous two games. Yeah, which is something that all the new Dead Space games, I mean, they all have you know some new enemy type. When it comes down to it, I feel like they're all sort of the same at the end of the day. Like yeah. some will run at you, you know. But that's true of most any game with enemies like that. Uh, did you feel like the 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 enemies that changed depending on where you shot them like made much of a difference? They the EA really played that up. Yeah, I actually like I kept forgetting because it it takes like a lot of memory space. I feel to remember like which enemies act a certain way, and they all sort of look the same in the dark a little bit, sure. except for the ones that are like incredibly gruesome. So I actually didn't even obey that a lot of the time, and I still had you know plenty of ammo. I, I have to say, this, this is one of the scenes that really got to me. The other mechanic of the rolling dodge, which really only comes into play with the snow beast, um, which I thought was probably the weakest kind of major enemy. I mean, there's, there's the regenerating, Necromorph, which yeah, it's, I, I was kind of expecting that. More manageable than they were in the second one. Yeah, but but the snow beast, ne it never really made sense how you're supposed to kind of how they want you to be playing that, and it looks like they want you to dodge. The dodge doesn't seem to work, and then there's the second encounter. This is my favorite, where the first time you see him, big open space, cool. Okay, I get this. I'm gonna run around and shoot him. And I was like, smaller space, and there's crates. So every time you're trying to get out of the way, it's like, oh, I ran into a crate. This is the part where you have to shoot harpoons into him, yeah. right? Yeah. So when I was no, fighting No, that's him, the third uh, sequence. Oh, it's the second part. Right. Yes, you yes. fight that guy three times. <laughs> the third time I fought him, where you're supposed to shoot harpoons into them, uh, I didn't figure that out until really late, and I had used most of my, my health packs. And then I get over to the left harpoon, and I realized that I had shot off one of his tentacles, and it was blocking the harpoon, and it was still there as a physics object. Oh, oh, oh could dear. you blow it away? I, I could have lifted it and moved it with Kinesis, but as I was starting to, he smashed me. Oh. 
I'm sorry. I remember I, I died a few times during that sequence. I, I, I died quite a few times, because it's also sad. I need to run, there's something behind me. <laughs> I also need to somehow read the environment. I mean, and, and, and with that in mind, there are puzzles in the game. There's there's almost like the the, the mini games when you're hacking something. something sure. like oh, that. And there's, there are the other puzzle elements that use your stasis and your kinesis. Yep. And I thought they did a fairly good job of telegraphing to the player how you're supposed to get through them. But yeah, there's always says that sense of urgency because yeah. something's about to kill you. Exactly. That, it really, I think, is challenging to try to design a sequence where you can handle those two things at the same time. And we were talking a little bit about character action games that had puzzles that would kill you if you did them wrong. Uh, and one of the things, Dead Space toes a very, very narrow line about making puzzles that can kill you but won't kill you unless you really screw up. Uh, like, you can actually not do them right once or twice and yeah. maybe not die. Uh, but the, the puzzles in Dead Space 3 that I really liked are the ones where you are doing the most engineering type things. Like when you're in space outside of the space station and you're taking panels off of an engine and undoing retaining bolts and then you slide the engine out of its casing. Like stuff like that. That's where I go, oh right, he really is an engineer and now I'm helping to build spaceships. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he, he isn't the, the naive that you are as the player. Right. Like, he actually is Isaac Clarke in those puzzle sequences. I'm not just putting blocks into holes and things turn on. <laughs> Although you do that too. That is what engineering is. Yes. Now, sure. now you remarked, I mean, that, 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 that is a really cool sequence when you're kind of just floating in space, you're seeing the debris. I mean, it was probably oh, yeah. one of the most interesting yeah. space sequences I've played in the game. I love the zero gravity sections yeah. in this one so much. Yeah. It just takes it so much further than it's gone before. and like. In Dead Space 2, when you were in zero gravity spaces, that's when it allowed you to move in every direction, yeah. but they were usually in like enclosed areas. And, and granted, there are like points where you can't cross in Dead Space 3, but the area is so big that there's a ton of stuff to explore. And actually, if you do explore, you can find some random stuff, including collectibles. Yeah. Um, and then other stuff like if you shoot specific panels on spaceships, there's always oxygen behind them. Yeah. Like little touches like that. Yeah. It's like, oh, so this may have been actually a spaceship. Which is, I thought was, was the nice touch because there's that sense that, okay, is, is any of this worth it? Like the world is pretty much over by the time that they leave Earth. I mean, there's, you know, the, the necromorphs are there, the ecologists are pretty much, you know, pretty screwed everything screwed. up. And that sequence in the graveyard, I think kind of underscores that sense of, Eh, we're all dead. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is a very, very, very grim world. Um, how the, the game is very long. It's one of the longest yeah. sort of single-player games. Yeah. Uh, granted, there's co-op. I, I played in a while. I started to wonder if it needed all of that content, or if it, it kind of it didn't really have enough yeah. rabbits in the hat to pull out to actually justify that. I feel like it's a testament to just how well-paced the game was that it managed to be interesting for that long. I mean, I never once felt bored at all while I was playing. I also did pretty much all of the optional missions, so right. I ended up getting like at least 20 hours out of it. Yeah, oh, I think yeah. I hit like 22, and the only thing I would say is that there are parts that feel like they're present so that it doesn't feel like it's on rails, um, where you're going through areas that look the same and you're fighting a spitter and guys that pop out of the vents and then the scorpion tail guys in basically the same room over and over again. And I really liked the combat, so that didn't necessarily bother me. But at some point it felt like they were there so that they could pad out or spread out the sort of... Yeah, really I've been seeing this in some games lately where I feel like I'm being tested. And I mean more like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 10 years old and there's, you know, I, I have to spell some words out that, you know, and it's, it's, it's kind of dragging that out a little bit. But that final sequence when you're kind of where the maker is and you know that you're kind of cl closing in, I mean, I, I think it worked there because th there's finally a sense of urgency that I think was kind of lacking slightly earlier in the game. Toward the end of the game is the, the only place in that game where I actually just started running past enemies. And oh, really? Stuff. Yeah. See, I'm, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm so obsessive. I'm like, no, I need to kill him because he might come up from behind me. Yeah. And I was viewing it. I was on a schedule. <laughs> Um, so the co-op, uh, I, I think you were marching review. It's it's not intrusive. No. no. This this game is a very good single player game, and then there's this co-op that doesn't really break the narrative whatsoever. I thought, I thought it was funny when everyone was hyping up. You know, oh, there's a second character, John Carver. What's his situation? What's going on with him? And he was like yeah. such a small part of the overall campaign. Even in the co-op, he's really not as important as they want you to think that he is. But the the most interesting. Uh, story and narrative stuff that Dead Space 3 does is stuff with Carver when you're playing in multiplayer and you play the co-op missions to the point where if you're playing as Isaac in co-op in those parts, you are not seeing 
the interesting stuff that is because true. all of the hallucination stuff that was in the other Dead Space games, like the things that were signaling his psychotic break, that's in Dead Space 3 in the co-op sections on Carver's side. Yeah. They did relegate a lot of the psychological horror elements to the co-op campaign, which I think is fine because the optional missions, the weapon crafting, those are all things that are going to make you want to go back and replay the game. And I feel like playing co-op on your second playthrough is is the ideal way to play it. And it's weird that it's like, at its core, it's such a loot grindy action game. Yeah. It's, al it's almost RPG-like in how grindy that it is. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but just that you go back to places that you played before and say, well, this time I'm gonna get that chest and we'll see if there's a different weapon part mm -hmm. in it. That, that is the strangest, most surprising thing about it. And, 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 and because of the weapon crafting system, I mean, there's that sense of reward that I think makes the, the, the replaying of it so much more satisfying oh, yeah. than, than, than other games. I mean, it's just like, okay, I wanna build some other stupid weapon and see how far I can get with that. Right. So let's talk about the other aspect of the game, this probably drawn the most attention, and that was the use of the microtransactions. Right. Which um, I'm going to say, I used them. Uh, it was, and and I, th I have to hand it to EA for doing one thing that was quite clever, that you don't see tungsten very often, if no. ever, in the beginning of right. the game, and you start to realize, that's really important if I want to have these really badass weapons. Yeah. And so I'm like, all right, I'll just buy some. It's, it's 80 points, and I saw myself doing that. Later in the game, it turns out, you can actually start getting quite a bit of the tungsten. Yeah. But they, they, they played a good one on me, and I wanted to try a, 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 a cool weapon. I actually didn't even realize until like five or six hours into the game that you could dismantle your weapons and collect resources from I them. I didn't so know I this was at like, all, actually. So, so when I first saw the microtransaction thing, this was my reaction. I was like, oh, ew. And then I like forgot about it. And then I realized later on, well, like, no wonder I have no tungsten, because I haven't been dismantling my weapons. And when I realized that, I realized it is very possible to create powerful weapons in the game before you reach the end of it. They may not be, you know, the crazy ones that they have in there, but a lot of those aren't even practical anyway. So you have to sort of decide for yourself, I think. The, the, the weird thing for me is that I played through the game first on a debug console. So the, the whole market system on a debug console yeah. is basically you have unlimited money because yeah. there's like credit cards that don't exist. So <laughs> this is a situation where I could have literally bought my way to the end of the game. But I didn't because it just didn't occur to me because there's like this, there's a pretty defined curve in the way that it gives you stuff to make um, and to upgrade your suit with and all of that. But when I played through it again on retail, like on, on like the normal Xbox 360, I actually did buy one of the resource packs a couple of hours in because I had gotten so accustomed to using the other weapons that I didn't want to slum it with the early stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I feel like they could have avoided a lot of the vitriol against that just by unlocking some of the later weapons after you reach like certain chapters in the game. Like once I mean, you get to chapter four, then you can withholding. start to build these crazy weapons. So people don't feel like they're at such a disadvantage from the very beginning. Yeah, which I don't think you are, but there's those options. I, I had not considered this idea that, that you just brought up. Could the microtransactions be there more for second or third playthroughs or with co-op where you don't want to have the full languid experience of it, and you know, right. like you kind of know it's around the corner. You might want to be a little bit more efficient yeah. in how you play through it. I doubt that's how they designed it, but no. I think the only the sort of frustrating thing about the first few hours of Dead Space Three in particular is that the the plasma cutter, because it has become the game, the weapon that's synonymous with the game, just doesn't feel as effective as it did in Dead Space One and Two, and that's because it doesn't have any upgrades and blah blah blah, and you're supposed to use other weapons. But it still it took me a while to get over that sort of thing where I'm used to using this one weapon. That is my, com my constant companion. And my constant companion isn't serving me as well as I want it to. Um, but once I started getting upgrades and all that stuff, it became less of an issue. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I, I think the fear sets in in the beginning and then you slowly sort of overcome and you understand what the logic is of the weapon crafting and everything and you really slip into it. Uh, so let, let's just talk about the very, very end of the game. Isaac dies, sacrifices himself. Oh, yes, I never, I never saw that one coming. Or does he? Or does he? <laughs> and um, do you think that they've opened the door for Dead Space 4? I know this is a point of discussion right now if it actually exists, if it was canceled, but ignoring all of that, I mean, does this series have a place to go? I mean, they, they, they open the door with those last few words that Isaac says after the credits. Yeah, obviously. There's, there's always an open 
They can is there a even satisfying in the most, way for even the in the series most final go? story. You know what? I feel like they could actually continue the series and maybe not make a proper sequel, but focus maybe on another protagonist it's, or something. It seems like a primary or or prime opportunity to take the series backwards. Like to do like the discovery of the original marker yeah. as mm-hmm. an example because they lay the groundwork that awful stuff has happened every time a marker has been found without fail. Yeah, like that it has always gone catastrophically badly for every civilization, human or otherwise, that's found it. So all they have to do is discover that marker somewhere else or go back in time to when Altman found the first marker and everything that happened around that. Uh, I think that's it for our discussion. Of Dead Space Three, Tara, Arthur. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you have sat through this and know nothing of the game, then I, I, I should encourage you, go read Arthur's review on Polygon and definitely see Tara's review at uh, Rev3Games, youtube.com slash Rev3Games. Uh, that's it for this edition of Spoiled Games. We will be talking about more games down the line. So come join us. Have a conversation. Don't screaming.